Hello, my name is Ian Antonio Patterson coming to you for another episode of Life is Feeling, Counting the Ways. And in today's episode, you will get insight into how to deal with the eventuality of you finding yourself in a minority position and how to take notice of and better regulate your own passive biases. We all have them. Here you'll get a chance to learn from the experience of others. I'll mention three real true-to-life examples as bases for my little monologue today, and I hope they will add an air of legitimacy to this episode. Now, the first example that I'm going to use today is one thing that happened in the summer of 2004. The second example that I'm going to draw on is something that happened on January 15th of 2022, And the third event was much more recent. It happened on May 24th, 2023. Now, this last one is so poignant that I feel compelled to do this episode. It ties in well with the reason why I'm so happy that I've named this show the way I have, especially confronted with this, the dawn of artificial intelligence, as we're forced to reflect on the things that differentiate us as human beings from the machine. The new awareness with which we might have to adjust our perceptions of the world we live in going forward and how these things will affect the youth. Now, today's also my hundredth episode. It's episode 17 of Life is Feeling Counting the Ways, but For those of you who have been following my shows, for example, English Coach Podcast, Living the Language, the bigger sister show to this one, I started with that podcast in June of 2019. Now, I didn't publish until a little bit later, but the whole planning of it did, in fact, start round about June, a little after I got my first microphone. Today is the 21st of the 6th, 21st of June. And I quite recently published episode 83 as well of the English Coach Podcast. So together with episode 83 and the 17th of Life is Feeling Counting the Ways, that makes for a hundred episodes. I'm very proud of myself and I think I should be in a position where I can actually do an episode impromptu, so to speak, unplanned, authentic, you know, full of feeling and real events that you know, kind of forms the character of why I do this podcast and how I do it. It helps me also to feel like a bona fide independent podcaster. And that is one of the things that makes it different from other podcasts that can't exactly call themselves independent. Now, you know, after four years of podcasting, I've come to realize that different people get different things from my episodes based on the feedback that I get. Some people actually use my episodes to fall asleep. And you know what? That is perfectly fine. As long as you're deriving some kind of benefit from my episodes, that makes me very happy. It makes me even happier when you tell me. You can tell me what you get from the episodes. I also know what it's like to suffer from insomnia. So if you're telling me that my episodes help you to suffer less from insomnia, that is absolutely wonderful. Now, getting into the meta of the episode, as I usually start, well, I try to start with my preamble, you know, sometimes so people know what the show is about. Life is Feeling Counting the Ways is a self-sponsored independent podcast brought to you in association with iAntonio.media. The show is essentially an art project where we explore different career roles and converse with ideas. It's not exactly made for children and at times will feature sensitive content based on a wide repertoire of unique lived experiences of people. Listener discretion is strongly advised. The show, as usual, explicitly promises no answers to anything whatsoever and, as the name suggests, explores feelings. Everybody here speaks for themselves. Nothing is cast in stone. And we all are, in true human fashion, expressly allowed to change our minds. Life is Feeling Counting the Ways does not offer advice based on the professional opinion of licensed lawyers, psychologists, psychiatrists, teachers, moral authorities, or the like. 
I am myself a trainer, but more likely than not, I am not your trainer. When in doubt, consult a professional. For more information, questions, or contributions, feel free to visit lifeisfeeling.com and use the contact form. Now, we all find ourselves to varying degrees of intensity in situations like this. I suspect that the real question that we have to ask ourselves at times when, you know, we feel as if we now suddenly belong to a minority is, where does the power live? And who in that particular situation or constellation feels entitled to privilege, resources, or social status bestowed upon them by the group? And in the same breath, who doesn't feel that way? Who is allowed to take the stage within this constellation on ownership of the biggest pain, as I like to say? Who is the underdog and who is allowed to complain about it? We're all affected by these things from time to time. And sometimes all we have are the wisdom of hindsight or the experience of others to help us to cope in these situations. Now, sometimes depending on your perspective, you might feel that many of us don't really suffer in any meaningful way from being a part of a minority, having themselves more significant access to power from other places. Some of us also like to create our own stories of being disenfranchised, real or unreal. But then again, as human beings, we all sometimes feel discriminated against. And you know, that is to be taken seriously. And these feelings of discrimination might be based on a whole host of things, such as age, origin, sex, hair color, skin color, sexual orientation, accent, marital status, education, wealth, height, weight, and imagined things. Now, as I said, all of these things deserve to be taken seriously at the time. So, you know, don't be surprised. You know, it might happen to you. One good example that I use sometimes, you know, for some of the people who, or let's say people who listen to the show sometimes and or people with whom I come into conversations regularly, you might, for example, be a speaker of English as a second language, but find yourself in a room filled with native speakers, could be Americans. And all of a sudden, you're the only one in the room, maybe looking different, dressed differently, and speaking with a totally different accent. You would be surprised of how powerless you can feel sometimes or how powerless we allow ourselves to feel just because of that. And these feelings of disenfranchisement and powerless are as real as any other. So then, I hope you learned something from the episode today. I hope you like it. And without further ado, on with the show. Now, what are these scenarios or scenarios that I'm talking about? The first of them was something that happened in the summer of 2023 when I was studying in a place called Frankfurt Oder in Germany, sitting on the eastern border of Germany. When I was living there, I could throw a stone into Poland. Something very peculiar happened there once. The second event happened on the 15th of January, 2022, when we were still, you know, reeling under the COVID restrictions. And I think at that time they were slightly opening things up and we got a chance to actually go out a little more in groups. And I was traveling or, you know, touring with a very good friend of mine, still a very good friend. Um, we were in Kudam in Berlin. And I remember that day I had the need to buy Kentucky Fried Chicken and I did it. And after that, we did some shopping. The third event that I'm going to use today as an example is something that happened on the 24th of May, much more recently, 2023. All right. So I really hope you, you know, you, know, you learn from these um, little stories. As I said, I'm just going to, you know, just run with it. And let's see how this happens. You know, after 100 episodes, I should be able to do this. All right. Now, the first event that happened in Frankfurt Oda was, 
you know, one time I was at the, what we call the Studentenwohnheim in the yard. And I can remember clearly there was this guy, you know, tall, very tall, blonde person. And he was studying at the time Kulturwissenschaft, which is cultural sciences. And this guy, you know, I mean, he was into reggae music. He had dreadlocks and, you know, he kind of lived the lifestyle of someone who you know, wears dreadlocks and likes reggae music, as well as some other things that are sometimes associated with that lifestyle. And I remember particularly that guy coming over to me and offering me a joint. You know, he offered that I smoke with him. And it was summer. Well, it wasn't really the height of summer, but it was getting warm, almost summer, I, I suppose. And we were moving up towards exams. And I remember on that day, I was preparing for some exams. And, you know, I had the exams coming up in about two or three days. And it was in statistics. Now, this guy came to me and he said, well, you know, I'm smoking a joint. Do you want to join me? And, you know, I looked at him, you know, as a nice guy. I had spoken to him before. And, you know, I mean, there are some issues with people who, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go into the appropriation thing, which is not really a topic of mine. Um, but, you know, he smoked weed regularly and he was just convinced that me being the Jamaican there, he had known me at the time, I must want to smoke with him. And I remember saying to him, listen, man, I, I cannot smoke, you know, because I have an exam in two or three days. And um, if I do that, then I won't be able to retain anything. And I remember particularly, I can't go into the details of it as in the time of day and, you know, how many people were there and so on. But I know it was a crowd of people. There were, you know, quite a few people. It was one of those little parties that we usually have in the Schrenvona. I mean, you know, there's some beer drinking, there's probably a grill and so on. So there are quite a few people there. And I refused his offer to smoke, to join him for a joint. And, you know... To this day, it still surprises me how that guy responded because I quietly rejected him. I didn't, you know, make it an event to, you know, I mean, I have no need to do that, you know, make it an event, a rejection. I don't go around looking for reasons to reject people, to boost my ego or whatever. But I just told him that I can't. And, you know, for some reason, that guy took serious offense to it. And in that moment, no sooner had I said that, he started to shout and he told everybody, come look at this guy rejecting his culture. He doesn't want to smoke with me. Who does he think he is, this Jamaican? Yes, doesn't want to smoke with me, behaving as if he's better than I am, rejecting his culture, you know? And I mean, I was so shocked by that, you know, I mean, looking at this guy, you know, this German guy looking at me with a big fat joint in his hand and... um telling me that I'm rejecting my culture just because I'm not in the mood to smoke with him. And, you know, at that time I was, I was lost for words, but I, I think I retreated. I don't think I really responded, but you know, a lot of things, they say vision is 2020 in retrospect. And that was one case in which, you know, people can have a strong, such a strong perception of you such that as a minority, you know, whatever that minority might be, as I said, maybe the only German in the room filled with Americans. You know, that's a very good example. Some of us travel and we know what that's like. People, they have such a strong, let's say, idea of who you're supposed to be that if you step away from that, they feel betrayed and they feel as if you have done them a wrong, right? And you know, I'm I'm not a psychologist, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist or any kind of professional where that is concerned. The only thing I can talk about is how I felt at the time. And also with the wisdom of hindsight, you know, I'm looking back at this also with a lot more experience. It was in 2003 that that happened. I know that people sometimes do that. And you have to be gentle with that. You know, as I say sometimes to people, you know, I mean... You know, um, it's not always about 
finding out what people know. Yes, finding out what people believe, but finding out what they want to know. Yes, finding out what they want to believe and working accordingly. You know, there is also the saying that I use sometimes, you know, people believe what they see and they see what they want to believe, you know, and sometimes the trick in life is to first find out what they want to believe. So, you know, I just wanted to share that, you know, I mean, it's still surprising to me that that happened. And that was one of the first things, the question as to how you would deal with that is probably just to be aware that people have their own perception sometimes. And maybe sometimes the best thing to do first is to find out what exactly is their idea of who you are and then working accordingly and also treading lightly sometimes because you know sometimes these preconceived notions or stereotypes or prejudices or whatever they might be sometimes it's also a positive kind of discrimination where you know they might see you as some kind of a superhuman you have to be careful with that tread lightly especially if you're not in a position of strength to resist any kind of backlash that might come now the second event that happened that I wanted to talk to you about, which is similar to this first one, happened on the 15th of January, 2022. As I said, I went out with my then roommate, yeah, at the time. And, um, you know, I was happy because I could finally go to Kentucky Fried Chicken again. Yeah, I'm not too proud of it. I go there probably twice, three times a year. And I was happy to get some fried chicken. We had the fried chicken and then after that we went shopping, you know, into some fancy little stores and we bought some fancy little things. There are some photos of that event as well that I might share with you. But, um, you know, it's not about what we did or the fun that we had when we went out shopping. It was an unusual day. But it's mostly about what happened while we were sitting and uh, me, you know, me having my Kentucky Fried Chicken. She didn't want any. I think she had the fries. And while we were there, you know, we were looking like a couple. We were not a couple at the time, but, you know, I mean, we looked like that. We were both glowing, happy, radiant out. And, you know, people were out in the half warm day. And I think it was a sunny day, so a little bit cold. While we were there sitting, um, there were lots of young people floating around. You know, there's always a very mixed crowd hanging around at KFC, especially the one there in Kudam. And while we were there eating, a young lady out of the blue, I remember her appearance, she looked a little bit Asian, Asian meaning more on the Turkish or Arabian side. She was nicely put together, I would say, and she was pretty young as far as I know. She wasn't too tall, a little bit, just a tiny little bit on the chubby side. She looked like about, I would say, very early 20s, as I said, nicely put together. And she interrupted our conversation with the question, as to whether we wanted some company. Yeah. And at the first moment when she came over and offered to share some company with us, you know, as a bisschen Gesellschaft leisten, as we would say in German, my first response was to rebuff her immediately. And I said, no, 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 no. We're, we're not looking for any company. And um, I drove her away in such a strong way. I wasn't insulting, but I was very forthright with my no. She got it immediately, and it never occurred to me until I saw how she recoiled, turned away quickly, and retreated into the crowd as quickly as she could. And at that point, my heart was a little bit broken because... You know, all of us went through this COVID time and, you know, a lot of us were lonely. We didn't have the chance to go out and talk to people. Some people really need that. I needed that too. And there are a lot of things that happened because of this sense of isolation that a lot of us suffered, you know, this human element, this contact. And the only thing I can really remember, the thing I remember really most was the speed with which this young lady recoiled and, 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 and retreated. And I felt 
badly in that moment because my no was not exactly informed by what she said or her approach but mostly based on my preconceived notions as to what it is exactly this young woman might have been offering and i feel really badly about it because here i was in the same instance doing exactly the same thing as i sometimes accuse people of doing right um making assumptions no truth be told i don't know exactly what she was offering and i don't know if i just am in some kind of melancholic mood where i i, I feel the need now to 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 berate myself and, and and feel bad about saying no to someone offering company a fairly attractive young lady out of the blue you know all made up looking beautiful offering to join us for company um it's it's not really about that you know it's about the fact that i really don't know what it is that she was really offering and there is a possibility there is a chance that maybe all she wanted to do was to say hello sit with us and talk to us a little bit i feel so badly about it anyway i'll never get that chance again I, i'll never perhaps you know find out exactly what she wanted what she needed at the time but i also vaguely remember i think my friend at the time i won't mention any names she was also a little bit surprised with the force with which i basically rebuffed this young lady and she didn't protest because you know she wasn't sure either but um and we never really spoke about it i just recently asked her to remind me of the date and she sent some photos over so maybe i post one or two of them from that day we took some photos that day i don't think she knew or if you know what exactly this young lady wanted but i still feel badly about it and you know it's 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 important because what i'm actually saying here is as i said i belong to a minority myself and sometimes i am also affected by preconceived notions stereotypes prejudices that inform my decision and cause me to act before thinking now the third thing that i wanted to share with you was something that was quite disturbing and this happened to me on the 24th of may 2023 now i was in class as some of you know i'm a trainer i was in class and there were i don't know not so many, so many students in the class about seven and one student came in late a little bit late um, he had come from another class because at the time we were doing targeted preparation for the msa proofing so msa exams and ebbr and bbr proofing exams and he had come from another class and come into the english class and he came in looking quite perturbed and i remember asking him what the problem was and immediately he said even though you know i don't like when people immediately come in disturb the class and immediately take the attention onto themselves but this young man seemed bothered and he said to me mr patterson um i have my exam coming up and i don't know what to wear and i'm like what what, what are you talking about you know or where are you usually wear and and then I asked him again, what does he mean? What is he worried about? And he said to me, well, he's a black man and he is sure that that's going to affect the perception people have of him in the exam. And, um, you know, at that time I, I thought about it and I was lost for words. I didn't know what to say to him because I was well aware of that fact. I know that that plays a uh, role in how someone is perceived and also affects the chances you have in exams i mean you know uh the people who administer these exams yes they are human beings as well and they're also affected by preconceived notions and you know um the young man was worried as to what he would wear and i remember being really lost for words i didn't know what to say to him me sitting there in front of i would say 80 percent of the students had 
backgrounds, foreign backgrounds. You know, they were, they didn't look like typical Germans. Some of them were, but they didn't look European. And there is this guy asking me what he should do. He's worried about what he should wear. And, and um, you know, they're the, the answers that I have in my mind. And they're also the answers that I think that he can process as a young man, maybe in his late teens. And I remember saying to him, well, you know, in the first instance, listen, this is one you need to talk to our psychologist about. And um, But I think about it and get back to you later on. I went home and I thought about it and the only answer that I had for him was, you know, young man, no names of course, you have to decide for yourself if you need to look street at your exams. Now, you know what I mean when I say to look street, that could mean you know, baggy clothes, big sneakers, extremely white, you know, brand names all over the place on your shoes, on your trousers, on your pulley, um, maybe excessive accessories, things hanging all over the place and so on and so forth. Things that might cause the impression that you take your clothing and your appearance more seriously than you take your exam. You have to decide if you want to give that impression what is the impression you want to give do you want to look street in front of the examiner or do you want the examiner to at least get the feeling that you take the proceedings seriously that was the question he had to answer that for himself and then i said to him if you were to ask me specifically what you should wear i would say stick to what it is you normally wear however for the exam you wear a simple pullover with no brands, right? Not too big, not too small, just normal, traditional, very simple pulley, yes? A pullover with no markings on it. And that's what I said to him, you know, and also to be mindful of, you know, the fact that he has to decide if he wants to look street, if that look helps him, helps the attitude of the examiner, and to think about the impression that he wants to give and the impression that will serve him. He should also think about if it makes sense for the examiner to feel as if he at least takes this exam event seriously. Now, that was a very poignant thing in itself, you know, in and of itself. I mean, as I said, you know, these three things were very bothersome and I'm still thinking about it, you know, I'm not going to go too deeply into it today because, you know, we could go into a very long rabbit hole and, you know, from all of these things, I'm looking at these three bullet points right now. The only thing I could say is that we have to try, at least try to be aware of the preconceived notions that we have of people around us. Yeah, before we cast judgment, right? And we also have to be aware of the fact that people are also carrying these around and you have to decide to what extent how much energy you're going to place into correcting that, if it's worth it, if it's something that you can work with, um, if it's your job to change the world where that is concerned. I mean, some of these preconceived notions can, in the interim, actually be positive if you have a good escape. Um, but... You know, try to be mindful of these things and know that they flow from both directions. Now, another thing that, you know, from these three events and also the last event that happened, which was, you know, the most recent, the 24th of May, 2023, is something that I also told to another group of my minority students, as you might say, you know, people who do not have a German background, obviously, um, they don't look that way. There's a certain look, you know, for want of, or, you know, at the risk of getting into trouble. But um, for these people, you know, I say to them that, you know, we have to come to terms with that. Um, people will have these notions, regardless. And just to repeat, as I said, you know, people believe what they see and see what they want to believe. The first question is finding out. Is it worth it to find out what they want to believe and shape your story accordingly? Yes. Is it worth it to do that? And 
The second thing that I would pull from these three experiences is, you know, the comfort, you know, taking comfort in the thought that sometimes if it's not really worth it to try to change the world in that moment, if it's not your priority at the time, if someone is so convinced as to what you are and who you are without the benefit of evidence or knowing anything about you, that says more about them than about you. Even if someone, if someone looks at you and says that you are someone that cannot be trusted based on nothing, that says to you immediately that you should watch out because this person themselves might not be someone that you can trust because they're reflecting, they're projecting. If they know nothing about you but can say something about you, then that thing that they're saying is more about them than about you. And it is an, an approach and affirmation that has helped me a lot, you know, as a real minority living in a European country for, you know, going on 20, 21 years now. And, you know, it's not really, it's not a flag that I'm flying around every day. It's not something that I have to go on the street and sing a song of, yes. But it is something that has quietly helped me to retain my sanity also sometimes when, you know, people are convinced as to who I am, you know, they tell me who I am. And, you know, there are cases where, you know, I have to say to people, you know, tell me more about what I believe and what I think. And it's only in that moment they realize their error. Right. So that was it. And, you know, I did this one impromptu. It is my hundredth episode, a little bit, you know, melancholic, probably towards the end. And, you know, I really hope this helps. It's, as I said, it's not just about people with foreign backgrounds, but, you know, I mean, everybody can find themselves in a position of being a minority. And it can also be with positive or more positive attributes as well. You know, you could be in a group of people yeah, um, who are less qualified, less skilled, less talented than you. And, you know, they can gang up on you just the same. And when I say positive, I mean that you might suddenly find yourself in a position where your supposed special attributes as a minority are celebrated in a larger-than-life way. A lot of this could be about exposure, education, myth, or infatuation based on your very presence and articulation in that moment, disproving a whole history of misperceptions that you yourself might not be even aware of in the moment. Maybe people are just nice, you know, or maybe it could be an overcompensation of sorts that is both unrealistic and unsustainable, sometimes by accident and sometimes by design, in which case it happens not for lack of exposure or education, but is rather insidious. You have to be careful of that, you know. Your enthusiasm as a minority, again, to be accepted as a normal, essentially productive participant could lead you to just swallow up this praise blindly. The challenge here is to be mindful of the fact that what might appear to be positive praise, that is, as I said, larger than life, is actually dehumanizing, an objectification that can turn ugly in an instant. Maybe it's ugly already because you don't know where it's coming from. The worst atrocities in life begin with dehumanizing others. So how to deal with that, we could ask ourselves. What advice could I give to a, a young person, you know, feeling doubtful and helpless, perhaps. I'd say stay positive, keep looking forward, even in an oral exam. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Accept reasonable compliments with the grace of gratitude and humility and give it back immediately. 
If someone says, for example, that you have something magical in your blood, think of something magical that they have in their blood too, and be equally as generous with reciprocal praise, or give them the stage by asking. Again, this happens everywhere all the time. It's just a fact of life, you know, it affects many people, perhaps all people. You know, why? Because people are people. And if the human brain is basically a prediction machine, it will always be looking for the uncommon denominator. And that can play out in many ways. You know, so it could be helpful for anyone who might find themselves in a position where they're singled out and seen as something different. So that was it for my 100th episode. I am very proud of myself. I haven't heard it yet. I'm very curious to see how long it was. And I am now heading off to meet with my newfound friend. And, uh, you know, we're going to enjoy some of the beats of Fête de la Musique in Berlin. And as usual, if you like what you heard, please do share the episode with a friend. You're also free to, you know, send me some feedback, send me some input. The input you send is something that satisfies me, gives me a sense of fulfillment. It gives also the guests of the show a strong sense of fulfillment. And it also helps me to get even more, even more engaging guests onto the show so that you can enjoy some of these insights, all right? So, Ian Antonio Patterson again, saying goodbye for another episode, episode 17, my 100th podcast episode of Life is Feeling, Counting the Ways, and I'm looking forward to the next time. 